now I shall invite Dr. Nitin Barkula, whom we know very well, and he is addressing a question about cardiac oncology because all the echocardiographists are facing the same problem in our city at least where the chemotherapy has increased in leaps and bounds because of its availability. Dr. Barkulla. Uh, thank you, respected chairperson and my friends. Now, first thing, let me tell you that the oncocardiology is a full-time profession. What we are doing is not a justice. We are a part-time oncocardiologist. And all the time we are thinking just of an adriamycin and tratsosumab and the LVF measurement. But there is a huge thing what cardio-oncology can be. So that's why I'll just show you one case, okay, which is completely different. Now, this is a 69-year-old lady, non-hypertensive, non-diabetic. She's on chemotherapy for chronic myeloid leukemia. And now she complains of grade 3 dyspnea uh, on exertion. X-ray shows cardiomegaly. She was on imatinib, which was uh, resistant, so she was changed to dasatinib. And this is her, uh, uh, MRI. I'm directly showing the MRI. Perfectly normal LV function. But just look around it. There is a huge pericardial effusion. Okay, just look at the short axis here. And you can see that the LV-RV function is all fine. A huge pericardial effusion. So, and you look at the gadolinium, there is no myocardial damage. Absolutely no myocardial damage. Look at the T2 maps. There is some edema in the myocardium. And uh, look at the T1 maps and the extracellular volume rise in the T1 maps and some myocardial fibrosis. So that means there is so much, so many things happen in the heart with the oral chemotherapeutic agents. And actually dacetinib has got this black box warning of producing uh, pericardial effusion and pleural effusion uh, in almost 50% of the cases. So that means we should know as a cardio-oncologist the side effects of each and every of these drugs. It's not just LVEF calculation, okay? So that means this patient, you have a myocardial interstitial fibrosis, you have some inflammation in the myocardium, on top of that you have got a large pericardial effusion which was the acute cause of it. And this generally settles with glucocorticoids. So, so why there is so much of chaos and why, there is, uh, that why this is a science in evolution? Because if you look at the FDA approvals of the chemotherapeutic agents, uh, almost every year they will have a new molecule coming in because in the cellular metabolism there are so many targets for the, uh, for the uh, oncology care that you can block and every time you are getting a new drug. And the approvals are generally many times com on compassionate basis, they are fast track, and secondly, they are generally used in advanced malignancies where the CV effects take a back seat. Okay, someone where you are looking for a survival which is increased from three months to one and a half year, you are not much bothered about what happens after three years with a, uh, for a CV effect. So remember that. The 66% of the chemotherapeutic agents, there is a FDA warning for CV monitoring. And, why? and this is a science in evolution. Many of these molecules, we still don't know what kind of effects they are going to have on the cardiovascular system. So what to monitor, how to monitor, and what to manage after monitoring. Okay, that is the issue. So cardio-oncology is a separate specialty altogether. It is evolving, it is still in infancy, and it's going to be a full-time profession. It's already a full-time profession for some of the cardiologists. So the most important thing is, is a cooperative effect. Because remember, malignancy, the, uh, each one knows a part of the piece of the puzzle. The oncologist knows the tumor biology, and he has characterized the disease and actually the oncologists are much ahead of us uh, uh, cardiologists because they have much more personalized medicine. Unlike cardiologists where we lump everyone together and bombard them with beta blockers and ACE inhibitors. So the tumor biology and the choice of cancer uh, treatment the oncologist knows and the prognosis and as a cardiologist you know the patient's risk of developing a CV toxicity before starting chemo you also know the risk factors and how to manage them. So it's a complete cooperative effect for the simple reason that you may come out of remission from that malignancy and die of cardiovascular disease. So finally, there is no net outcome. Okay, so you are just trading one disease for the other. So that is why there is so much important that this is a cooperative effect. Second thing is all of us are in that particular zone that, okay, cardio-oncology is a EF monitoring in adriamycin and I see no. 
cardio oncology is much bigger ga gamut and what it is it looks into three different aspects at least broadly so of which the ejection fraction and myocardial dysfunction is only just one part of it but there are so many drugs which cause QT prolongation, so many drugs cause bradycardia, so many drugs called VT waves, and that's a complete specialty altogether. And thirdly, many of these onco drugs which actually act on the vascular signaling pathways, okay, like VEGF receptor blockers and so on and so forth, produce a very significant rise in the blood pressure. And that is also detrimental in long term because it rises very, very rapidly. Rather, the rise in blood pressure is taken as a positive effect of your chemotherapy because that means the vascular signaling pathways are getting blocked. So, but as a cardiologist, when you are approaching an onco patient, it's not just look at the EF and go away or look at the GLS and go away, look at his ECG, look for the QTs, look for the arrhythmias, take his blood pressure and then look because Probably that particular molecule still may not have the monitoring for blood pressure, but you will find over the next uh, six months or one year that, oh, this new molecule also causes significant hypertension. So it's a, complete, uh, it's, a, it's a complete cardiology care and it's a very large gamut of cardio-oncology. So what is the definition of cardiotoxicity? Now the first thing in 2016, the ESC promulgated this that any reduction in the EF below 50% or you have a 10% reduction from the baseline and it goes below the normal which they took 53%. So you have got 10% fall and which goes below 53 or any fall below 50 is, is a um, cardiotoxicity. And for the GLS they said whenever you go below 18 definitely you have got a toxicity or you have a 15% fall in your GLS, 15%, I'm not talking, talking. So 15% fall of your GLS and it goes below 18%. So that's the, uh, the, that is the definition of cardiotoxicity. But then there is a big chaos because each society has got its different ways of calling something cardiotoxicity. So if you look at the FDA, FDA says if your EF remains above 50, then we want 20% fall to call it cardiotoxicity. If they say if it is going below 50%, uh, then probably 10%. While if you look at the ISMO, that is the European Society of Medical Oncology, they say even 5% fall and if you are symptomatic clinically, we take it as cardiotoxicity. But I think instead of going into that confusion, let us remain with our AAC, remain, remain with the ESCV and AAC, the same definition that I discussed. Uh, that 10% fall below going 53% and that will take it as a definition of cardiotoxicity. Now, there are two perspectives. There's a cardiologist perspective and an oncologist perspective that who is going to develop the CV toxicity. So for a cardiologist perspective, what he's going to look at is whether he's elderly, whether there is a history of CAD, peripheral disease, whether there's an MI, whether there is atrial fibrillation, because so many cardiotoxic drugs produce atrial fibrillation and which itself causes acute problems, okay? So just get out of that mindset that you have to just look at the EF. Then whether the patient had an underlying heart failure, valvular heart disease, whether he has a baseline reduction in EF, whether there's a tobacco use, whether he's hyperlipidemic, because some of the uh, oncoders actually cause severe uh, dyslipidemia itself, whether it's hypertensive and as I told you, all those vascular signaling pathways, because when you attack on a tumor, you want to stop its blood supply, so you are giving the VEGFs, receptor blockers and so on, so forth, so that, you, uh, so that there is no further neovascularization, but all of them act on your regular vasculature causing uh, hypertension or even coronary spasms, so look at the diabetes, obesity, prior cancer treatment, and an abnormal baseline ECG, abnormal CT coronary calcium score, and abnormal lipid and HbA1c. So this is cardiologist's perspective because he wants to gauge that if you are having higher score on this baseline, then I will need to follow him very closely. Or if he's nothing there, is a young guy, nothing of this, and he's going to be put on anthracycline, probably I will need to see him probably once in... Uh, four months, once in six months, and so on and so forth. While for the oncologist, he has got a completely different perspective of what is the CV toxicity, okay, or what is the high chances of developing CV toxicity. So what for him, what is it? What, whether he is going to use the anthracycline and trastuzumab together, then the toxicity would be more. Then he would think that whether I am going to use a very high dose of anthracycline, then the problem will be higher. 
whether I am going to use modest dose, but also I am going to give him chest radiation, which is going to involve the heart, whether when I gave the uh, AC, uh, the anthracycline, and then the troponin uh, rose in the first cycle itself, okay, then there is a very high chance, and whether there is a uh, radiation which is going above 30 gyra. So remember, you won't have insight into that, while he will not insight into what CV risk factors you are looking at. And so that is why this collaboration and team effort is very important. So it's very important that in a cancer center, the cardiologist attends the tumor board meeting, okay? So that is why I'm telling you it's a full-time profession. What all of us doing is just a part-time cardio-oncology practice, okay? Now, after going to this, let us look at the LV function monitoring, okay? And this is a slide which, uh, this is the kind of slide which you should never make up, and I'll tell you why. Now, this is the LV function monitoring, and we know that if there is a risk of fall in the EF more than 10%, obviously, so what are those drugs? We, are, we just know anthracycline, thrasose, and finish, but the FDA has a warning for all this, and that's what I'm saying, you will not be able to even read that. So that's why this is how now the slides should not be prepared. But what I want to show you is that there is a host list of the different groups of drugs, okay, in Onco, which cause LV dysfunction. And just go to this particular um, uh, uh, review in the JAC in 2021 by Dr. Vijay Roy. Just go to that and go to the supplementary of, of this. It's not in the main article. Supplement and you will have all these list of drugs, okay. And these drugs keep on adding okay they keep on adding so that means this is this is the one which are which can cause it and so the, when you are monitoring lv function um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing always check the bp before you do the echo okay then measure gls measure 3d volume the lvef is much more reproducible if you are doing 3d lvef and if you are using 2d it has to be simpson and then look at the volumes then Consider CMR in some cases, and I will tell you which, and then combine the clinical data with biomarkers. Do not neglect the biomarkers. And what are the biomarkers? The nat uh, natriuretic peptide and the troponin, because they tell you some different aspects of the chemotoxicity, whether it is a failing heart with rising pressures or it is a myocardial injury. So in ECHO, what do you do? 2D Simpsons, uh, and perfectly do in, the, uh, in a very disciplinary way. Uh, uh, use ultrasound enhancing agents for a better EF. If you are using, if you have got a 3D, always do it on 3D. Then you do, and there there are challenges there. Now someone who had a left mastectomy because of the uh, CA breast, I mean the images are very bad. Okay, in that case use ultrasound enhancing agent instead of 3D. Then though everyone says use GLS, also look at GLS, GCS, GRS because this is an evolving science and you will hit onto something which will be much more useful. Look at the LA volumes and LA strain. And actually, uh, we are, we are uh, yet to publish it. Once I publish it, I'll, I can tell you. But the thing is, what we have found is that actually the LA volume enlargement is the first thing even before the GLS drops, okay? So, uh, but the LA volume enlargement and the LA strains go down much earlier. Then look at the diastolic dysfunction, look at the RV TAPSI, because RV and LA are actually get affected much earlier than the LV. Then the RV free wall strain, and also look at the TR, because there are drugs which actually just increase pulmonary pressures. So, so remember, there are so many classes of the drugs. Each class is targeting some different part of cellular metabolism. We have no clue as cardiologists. Only the oncologist knows that. So you have to get familiar with those drugs. And in those drugs, again, there are first generation, second generation, third generation. As the generation goes up, their remission rates are good and their CV effects are worse. So that is how you should know that this drug is uh, attacks this particular cellular pathway. And this has, is a third generation, has got atrial fibrillation or causes pulmonary hypertension. Otherwise, you will have no clue to what you are looking into that patient. Then. You look at whether there's a fall more than 10%, whether the GLS falls more than 15%, whether the end diastolic volumes increase, end systolic volume increase by 15 ml, and the end diastolic volume increase by 30 ml. Even if the EF doesn't drop, if they are increasing, they are telling you that there is a there is a uh, there is a remodeling. But let me tell you what I actually find more is that the patient is tachycardic. The next time he comes, he's really tachycardic. The EF may be still there, but he will be tachycardic. And then you will find that the GLS is dropped to 15%. EF may still be there. And the LA volume increased earlier. 
then the fractional area goes down, the free wall strain goes below 20%, 3D RVF drops below 45%, and the TR velocity goes 2.8. So it has to be an, uh, a, a comprehensive echo, not just write EF and give it, okay? And first of all, you should know what drug is on and what that drug causes, okay? So the thing is this, so this, so this is, a, this is a, just I would ask you that those who want to take it as their career, just start following the Jack Cardial Onco. Jack Cardionco is a new journal, every three months later it is published and it has got an extensive review of all these issues. So the thing is what you look at the EF, if the EF remains above 60% during monitoring and afterwards you don't really fall into the GLS thing. If it falls below 50%, you know you have caused damage. If they are between 60 and 50%, look at the GLS. Any GLS which is between 16 to 18 is a borderline loss. That particular one and the GLS where it drops below 16%, are the patients where you have to target them with the optimal medical ther therapy of neurohumoral blocking drugs. So like in this case, you can see that the EF has just dropped from 60 to 55%, so it's not a cardiotoxicity, but you look at the GLS, which has dropped from 20% to 16%, so it is almost 25% fall in GLS, okay, because uh, the patient is on anthracycline. While you are reporting GLS, use the same vendor machine, Mention it on your echo report that it was done on this particular system of this particular make and whether it was done on the system or you took it and did it on TomTech or EchoPack or QLab. Mention that because then and the next time the patient comes you use the same vendor machine, same machine, same software. Okay, that is important and while you are reporting the next GLS, the oncologist won't know what is a normal GLS so you should tell how much percentage change was there from the baseline then it's not that this dysfunction in these patients, see all these patients of uh, 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 oncotherapy, many of them share the same risk factors for atherosclerosis. So they are also prone to develop atherosclerosis and not only that, the atherosclerosis sometimes gets progresses uh, and uh, you can have plaque destabilization also and arrhythmias also because of the onco drugs. So remember that if there is a new onset of LV dysfunction, don't shut your eyes to that onco drug, but also look for ischemia evidence. Look whether you are controlling the hypertension or not, because as I told you, all those VSPs, the vascular signaling pathway uh, inhibitors, acutely rise the blood pressure, okay? And so then look for the arrhythmias because as I told you, some of them produce a very, like uh, some of them like imatinib and this dacetin, they produce atrial fibrillation. Patients get a lot of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and actually you may be looking at a tachycardiomyopathy, though the ECG may be in sinus when he visits you in your office. Whether it's a myocarditis, because now there's a new kid on the block which they call it as ICIs immune checkpoint inhibitors, supposed to be extraordinary drugs, but they produce myocarditis just out of the blue, without even fall in the GLS, without fall in the EF. The uh, myocarditis just comes out of the blue. Okay, so remember that that is a one uh, effect, if it is an immune checkpoint inhibitors, then thyroid abnormalities, many of them affect the thyroid and you may be hypothyroid or hyperthyroid, and also it can still be a genetic cardiomyopathy, or it can be even a takatsubo, because these Patients have got a lot of neuropsychiatric issues, <laughs> malignancy patients, so they get a takatsubo also. So remember that the fall in the EF is not only chemotoxicity, it can be any of this. When do you use the cardiac MRI? It's, uh, the cardiac MRI, the access and the cost makes it absolutely um, impractical to do it. Actually, it has got a, a, a very strong predictive value for knowing very early cardiotoxicity because the first thing that happens with anthracycline is the intracellular edema. So on the MRI, you get a rise in T2 values without change in the extracellular volume. And that's the first thing that happens even before the GLS goes down, EF goes down, LA increases, LV increases, something like that. But it is very impractical to do that. But what you do, and most of the centers even in the Western Hemisphere they are doing is that you are monitoring the 3D LVEF. When it comes closer to 50%, and now you are worried that it's come now 51 and 52 and I'm crossed that 10%, now the probably the chemotherapy may stop, take one MRI because then the EF will be 5% higher. So you get another window period to put the patient on OMT and allow him to continue on the chemotherapy. And at the same time, as I told you, looking at the T1 maths, T2 maths, and the extracellular volume, you know the toxicity extent. And very interestingly, the first thing that happens in anthracycline is not only the intramyocardial edema, but late you get a fall in the LV mass, which you don't really realize on the echo. But the MRI can show you a first loss in the LV mass. 
and that is a, that is that fall in the LV mass is also a very early sign of toxicity. Biomarkers. Now, biomarkers actually work out to be much more cost effective than even doing echo or uh, MRIs to far extent. But biomarkers do not neglect biomarkers. As I told you that every onco patient, as you are looking at the ACG, as you are looking for his blood pressure and then the echo, also look at his biomarker data. Now, biomarker data, if the biomarkers are normal, they have got a very high negative predictive value. Probably then you don't need to do even an uh, EJ, uh, echo also. However, if you have a so the, uh, especially the patients when they are going to go on for an year and a two years on chemotherapy, it is really, really very costly for them to get their echoes done. So I think the biomarkers come in handy there. So the thing is, the, next, the, the most important thing is the, uh, for the high risk uh, anthracycline imaging plan is that every two cycle you do the echoes. And then once it is over or when you reach a dose of 240 milligram per meter square, then every cycle you do it. Then once the, the whole thing is over, then you do at six months and 12 months. And in next, uh, next year, don't leave him alone. Next year also, see him at least once a year or twice a year. And thereafter, you continue it three yearly or four yearly after two years. Okay, because you will find some of these patients treated for CA breast coming after five years with a dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure. Then long term follow up is very essential, especially the childhood survivors of cancer. And those who want to go into athletics or those who want to become pregnant, there you will again need a surveillance with the echocardiography. Then so this, so this is the chart and we'll just go for the high risk ones where you can see that every two cycles you are doing an echo and also taking a biomarker. And then uh, uh, after finish, you do it at six months and then 12 months and then every yearly. So the thing is the, uh, for the Tratzuzumab, you do the baseline and then every second or third cycle or every third month and after you have finished the cycles then at end of one year and thereafter you can reduce the frequency because generally that long term effects of trastuzumab are much less as compared to the anthracycline. So this is how the trastuzumab because this is the typical way they go. They first give anthracycline. So in anthracycline you do more, uh, more uh, imaging. Post anthracycline generally many of them put on uh, certain other adjuvant drugs which are also toxic. So before you start trastuzumab, again get an EF done and then on trastuzumab do it every third cycle and then uh, reduce the frequency after one year. So this is how it is and uh, so the moment you find that the EF is dropping, the GLS is dropping, just start them on uh, the uh, uh, optimal medical therapy. So as you know, the four pillars of your heart failure therapy, of which we don't know anything about what SGLT2 inhibitors do in the chemotoxicity. We don't know, uh, we know, we just start beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, or ARB, or ARNI, and a mineral corticoid receptor occur. But just this week, there was the, the meta-analysis for all these trials was published in the um, European Heart Journal, and they showed that actually it's only the beta blockers Patients, when they're put on the beta blockers, they showed the preservation of EF, while the ACE inhibitor and ARBs did not show much except in trastuzumab. But in anthracycline, only the beta blockers work. Now, this is a meta-analysis with all its limitations, but remember that uh, that is what I was telling you, that the first time when you see these patients landing with the problem, they are generally having a lot of resting tachycardia. And you put them on beta blockers and the EF definitely improves. Then comes the question, I got two minutes, the question of biomarker monitoring. If you look at the biomarkers, do both BNP and the troponin. If you have got both negative, you probably can get away with uh, no echo for next six months also. But however, if you have just troponin positive and the BNPs are okay, probably you are going towards a coronary issue, okay? Because as you know, there, there are certain agents like cisplatin and so on, they can produce coronary spasms, coronary infarcts, while you have got some, some uh, that ICI, as I was talking of immune checkpoint inhibitors, they just produce a fulminant myocarditis. You don't have any heart failure also before that. So look into the coronary issues of that. While if you have got both positive, you have to be very worried because that means there is a damage also and the heart failure also. So it's better to have both of this because you can have a whole list of things that can be happening. Why you are just thinking of myocardium? You can have obviously the malignancy, actually the second commonest cause of uh, death in malignancy is actually thromboembolism. So they may die of pulmonary embolism, they may have arterial embolism and strokes. So because, you know, as a paraneoplastic manifestation, you get a lot of thrombosis. So even even acute pulmonary embolism may manifest with a rise in uh, BNP. So always, so that's why if you do both of them, that myocyte necrosis and rise of filling pressures, you will start looking for those causes. 
Uh, I think with this, I, I got just 40 seconds, so I'll stop here with only one last slide of hypertension monitoring. Hypertension monitoring is very important part of it because we talked about the VSPs which are used very commonly and the TKIs. And most important thing is that the white coat hypertension is highest among the onco patients. So you do home monitoring or 24 ambulatory BP. And second most important point is that use ARBs because what happens is that the angiotensin, when it connects to the angiotensin receptor, it modulates the uh, the vascular endothelial receptors uh, also. So now you want to block the vascular endothelial receptors. So, so VGF what you are giving or EGFR what you are giving inhibitors. So the thing is you don't want, want them to be modulated by angiotensin also. So you give angiotensin receptor blockers also along with the VSP inhibitors and actually then the survival improves. So hypertension in presence of the chemo, uh, uh, chemo drugs, especially the vascular signaling pathways, use ARB. That's the only point I want to make. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Barkulle. Uh, thank you for frightening us rightfully and opening a Pandora box for new cardiologists to think about the, the session to start. Uh, thank you very much.